So this briefing is covering the latest inference uh, benchmarks as well as uh, MLPerf storage version 0.5, which is the first uh, incarnation of MLPerf storage. So we're going to run through uh, inference uh, fairly briefly with a focus on the new benchmarks uh, and then uh, talk about MLPerf storage in a bit more detail. And we've got a, a short overview of ML Commons. Uh, most of the folks here should be familiar with ML Commons, so I'm going to try to make this uh, uh, fairly fast. Um, the goal of this briefing is to help everyone understand ML Perf and ML Commons. Uh, again, ask us questions. Uh, and then just so folks know, in terms of ground rules, uh, you know, statements by me or by working group chairs are uh, on behalf of... Uh, ML Commons. Ah, Ray asked a great question. Um, how should we handle questions in line? Um, I think if you want to raise your hand, I think I can see that. Um, uh, I'm also okay if you kind of just cut in on audio. Like, I don't get offended when people interrupt me. Um <clears throat> Uh, Nathan, do you want to monitor the, or David, do you want to monitor the chat to look for questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, in here, uh, go back. Um, right. So statements by member companies are not ML common statements. So don't get those things confused. We are going to avoid any comparisons to competitors, uh, explicit or implicit. So don't tell you know, uh, don't uh, uh, use this as an opportunity to slag off your, your competitors uh, or your partners. Um, so for members of the press and analyst community, you should have or will shortly re receive uh, a copy of the results. I apologize that these didn't go out two days in advance like I wanted to. Uh, for those who are not aware, uh, I was uh, actually at Burning Man and uh, uh, getting out of there was a little bit uh, uh, delayed relative to my original plan. Um, we can talk about that later, but uh, you will get the results and the supplemental discussions uh, and, and this presentation as well. Everything will be in the Google Drive link listed here. Uh, many of you should have access to that. So just as a reminder, ML Commons is a global community. Uh, we have members from all across uh, six out of the seven continents uh, and uh, actively looking to get the seventh. Um, you know, we come together for collective engineering. Uh, you know, I think ML Commons is really unique in this regard. I don't believe there are any other organizations like it. There are a lot of ML focused organizations, but none that really do engineering. And there are a lot of engineering organizations, but none that really focus on ML. And so we're sort of at this really unique uh, sweet spot. Um, and it's really a privilege to uh, uh, lead this organization and support uh, everyone who's contributing. We're here today to talk about benchmarks. And again, the motivation here is that benchmarks ultimately help to define uh, where we are and act as a barometer on progress and then help drive us to improve. Uh, you know, I think one of the keys here is aligning things like buyers and sellers, designers and, and salespeople on what does it really mean to be better? Because uh, as the picture shows, if as anyone who has ever rowed knows, when everyone is rowing together, you go really, really fast. And if you aren't in sync, uh, then then progress is just much slower. So, uh, I really see there's a twofold purpose to uh, benchmarks in general and MLPerf specifically. Um, you know, machine learning is a full system problem. Uh, and I think you'll get to see sort of a, a really wide spectrum of that, uh, looking at storage, looking at inference. Um, so we have a lot of levers to improve performance. Uh, everything from data optimizations up to process technology, software improvements, and throwing more systems, more compute, more storage, more memory bandwidth at a problem. Um, uh, but the demands on performance are tremendous. 
some here's a sort of outline of the goals of ML Perf in the benchmark suite. We want uh, our performance results to be reproducible. We want them to represent production use cases, what people are actually doing. Um, we want to see uh, innovation, and it needs to be fair and useful. So um, that's really what we set out to do with ML Perf. And uh, the result is we now have a suite of benchmarks that really spans from the smallest systems to the largest, uh, measuring performance at many different scales across many different types of workload. Today, we'll be talking about you know, in the data center and edge inference suite as well as uh, storage, um, but you know, ultimately MLPerf incorporates uh, related workloads in training, mobile, tiny, all all sorts of different uh, uh, platforms. I'm, I'm particularly excited about the storage benchmark, which uh, brings us. I would say most of our uh, benchmarks were relatively compute focused. Storage adds uh, another perspective on that, and I'll get to talk about that. A little bit later. So Ray asked, is storage only in training? Uh, I'll talk about storage later on in the slide deck, but the answer is yes. Uh, MLPerf storage is really tightly coupled to training in HPC. Uh, so in past briefings, I've given a long overview of MLPerf inference. I'm going to go with a much shorter one. I may even skip some of these slides for the sake of time. Uh, however, there's a longer MLPerf inference paper here you can read if you're interested. Uh, as a reminder, in MLPerf inference, we have four different scenarios, single stream, multi-stream, server, and offline, representing different deployment um, uh, scenarios, really, um, right? So single stream is where, you know, the only thing you care about is the what's the latency for answering one query, uh, server sort of represents uh, online random query arrivals. Um, and so the, the the measure is throughput with a latency constraint. Um, offline has no latency constraint. And then there's multi-stream, which is throughput for eight images at a time sent in a synchronized fashion. <clears throat> uh, this is a list of the workloads in MLPerf version 3.1. You'll note there's two new ones uh, highlighted in green that we added. We're going to do deep dives on both of those in a little bit. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and both of these sort of have analogs in the MLPerf training benchmark suite. So if you were with us for our briefing last quarter, uh, these will be, the recommender will be pretty familiar, uh, but the uh, LLM is actually going to be a little bit different. So, um, Stay tuned for a moment. Uh, but, you know, these, I think one of the points is we're evolving the benchmark suite to reflect what's going on. So the recommender is much more reflective of modern practices. You know, we we added our first generation recommender a couple of years ago. We're now updating it. And then uh, our LLM uh, benchmark is uh, brand new this quarter and, you know, really reflects uh, the explosion of, you know, what sometimes people call generative AI, uh, large language models, uh, et cetera, uh, that, you know, we've been reading about in the news. So uh, for all of these benchmarks that are available in the server, uh, in the data center group uh, division, uh, data center requires uh, uh, publishing both server and uh, single uh, server and offline, excuse me. And so for the server performance, there is a latency constraint, right? Which is as you feed queries in to the system, it must respond uh, with a latency target, uh, right? You know, uh, no one really cares about visiting a website that takes a long time to render. Uh, they'll just lose interest and wander off. So our new recommender has a 60 millisecond latency constraint, well, the text summarizer is 20 seconds. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is so long. Um, and for the server scenario, 99% of all the queries must be under this latency target. Um, if uh, more of the queries are slow, then it's not a valid run. All right. So, uh, we have the results for MLPerf inference, which you can look at. We've got 
over 10,000 results this time. Uh, tremendous growth uh, compared to last round. We've got over 2,000 power measurements. Um, yeah, so medical imaging has no latency. That's a great question, Ray. Um, uh, and I think that's because there is no server scenario for it. Uh, Michelle, are you on? Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the medical imaging is just not typically handled in a server context. Um, just that's not a realistic deployment. So we have no server scenario for it. Uh, good eye, Ray. Um, all right, so going back. The people, the, the organizations that submitted to MLPerf inference are listed up here. I want to specifically call out uh, the folks in bold who are first time submitters to MLPerf inference. That's Connect Tech, Nutanix, Oracle, and uh, TTA, which is the Telecoms Technology Association of Korea. Um, you know, submitting to MLPerf is uh, really not a trivial feat. It's actually quite a significant accomplishment. It's not a point and click benchmark. It requires real engineering work and a real commitment to uh, AI, to customers and uh, machine learning. So, uh, you know, this is really an accomplishment for the teams at all of these companies. Um, and then on power measurement, we saw uh, results from the companies listed up here. And again, one thing to remember is that uh, pure performance measurements and power measure and performance with power can't really be compared, uh, right? A, a pure performance measurement will often choose to burn more uh, power in order to maximize performance, whereas you might see people down clocking or having more active power management in a power uh, measurement context. Um, now, uh, Anand asked, does server location matter on-premise versus cloud versus edge will make a difference? Yes, that is true uh, in the sense that the end user perceivable latency, the network matters, right? Um, is the network, are you traversing the network from San Francisco to Korea or San Francisco to San Jose? You know, there's many milliseconds of latency there. What we are looking at is the latency of taking a query in host memory, generally speaking, and getting the response into host memory. Um, a large portion of that is uh, because uh, host memory is generally where IO tends to target, right? And uh, for server, you might be using networks uh, and, and you are very likely to be using a, so for instance, a PCI Express connected network card. Uh, but in the offline scenario, you might actually be reading straight off of storage. Uh, and so it's sort of hard to have a uh, unified view of how these things work, right? Uh, sort of similarly in an edge device, uh, you might not have any network there at all. You could have a directly wired PCIe device, uh, like a sensor, or it actually could even be using a different protocol. So for instance, um, you know, some sensors use MIPI uh, in the context of smartphones. So uh, the, the latency here is uh, a response latency sort of from host memory to host memory. So if you're using an accelerator, that includes the time to traverse to get into and out of host memory. Um, and then we have our new recommendation in LLM benchmarks, and we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on those in a moment. One thing I'm especially proud of is we got 15 submitters for our LLM for GPTJ and nine submitters for our uh, new recommender. Um, so, you know, this is like a huge amount of participation for a new benchmark. And I think some of that really reflects the interest uh, in these areas. So uh, I'm first going to talk through the uh, recommender. Uh, and a lot of this will be familiar to folks who have seen the presentation I gave last quarter because it's fairly similar. 
Um, so we this is our third generation recommender. Our first was NCF. Uh, our second was DLRM V1, and now we've moved on to sort of a second generation DLRM. Uh, you know, recommendation is very much an underappreciated aspect of machine learning. It sort of is behind the scenes for, you know, many things determining the content we look at, how you see uh, recommendations. It can be used in fraud detection. Um, one of the biggest changes we made was moving to a multi-hot representation. Uh, and I wanted to briefly explain that before we go on. Typically, in a lot of recommenders, you will have a table uh, where conceptually each row of the table uh, is a user, a customer, something like that. <clears throat> and uh, in a multi-hot representation, each row is associated with multiple columns, but each column can be a vector. Uh, and sort of more complex data. So for example, uh, you know, the, the one I wanted to give is if you imagine that each row of the table is users and you're looking at TV, you might be looking, you know, let's for, for a moment, imagine that each column is a title, right? You've got Game of Thrones, you've got Succession, you've got Jeopardy. Um, you don't want to know just, hey, did your uh, user watch that title? Are they interested in it? You might want to know how many episodes did they see? How many minutes of each episode did they see? Uh, do we think they fell asleep during it? How did they rate it? Um, or, you know, is, uh, you know, what is the content type, right? You know, Game of Thrones and Jeopardy are a little bit different. I haven't seen anyone get beheaded in Jeopardy yet. Uh, right. So you might want to capture many different dimensions uh, in your embedding table in a recommender in order to produce better recommendations. So that was really one of the biggest improvements we made in uh, DLRM DCN v2. We also expanded the size of the data set to be more representative of uh, uh, industry uh, practices going from one to four terabytes. And uh, the result is higher accuracy and much more compute. <clears throat> um, we're also doing about 5x more memory operations due to the multi-hot lookups in the embedding table um, with, you know, correspondingly about 5x more compute uh, in the network. So uh, this is an overview of the data set. Uh, I am going to sort of skip past this and let folks read offline. Um, the key thing about the recommender is uh, the, the for, sort of first stage is you have a combination of dense features uh, that are can be put into a uh, classic uh, multi-layer perceptron network. Uh, and then you have this embedding lookup. And that's this table I was talking about that is now multi-hot. And that contains sparse features, right? Typically, if you imagine in Netflix, there's probably no customers that have actually seen every show in Netflix. Uh, or if it is, it's some sort of, you know, beta tester, right? Um, so the, the features there are really sparse in general. Uh, you know, you could, again, think about like shopping at Amazon. Most people have not looked at every item in Amazon. In fact, I su suspect no one has looked at all items in Amazon. Um, so you first do this embedding lookup to pull out a uh, dense representation that is then paired with the multi-layer perceptron that took in the dense features. You communicate about the interaction between these two things and then do more compute at the end. Um, so this is pretty representative of state-of-the-art recommendation. Uh, this model was uh, built by a team, including uh, many folks from Facebook, and was in particular sort of constructed to not exactly match what Meta does in production, but to be representative of. Um, and so this is, you know, one of the ways that we can ensure that our workloads are very relevant uh, and meaningful. Um, here are some more details about the network. Um, I, and then, so there's some specific details on how this network operates in inference that I want to dive into. So first, it is a data center only workload. So that means it's only tested in server and offline scenarios. 
um, there's a quality target. As with all inference benchmarks, the reference model hits a particular accuracy, in this case, 80.31% area under curve. Um, and when you submit, you can either do 99.9% .9 accuracy, so that would be just a tenth of a percent degradation in accuracy is allowed to support quantization. Um, and then uh, we also have a 99% accuracy. So, you know, in, in, in practice, you know, my understanding is that for a lot of critical revenue related activities, you're going to be looking at more like this 99.9%, .9%, right? You know, if any accuracy loss results in a loss of revenue, that's not very interesting. Uh, but there are other recommendation applications where, you know, you can get away with less accuracy. So um, we've got uh, uh, a couple of different quality targets. And then the uh, server constraint on latency is under 60 milliseconds. And, you know, to be frank, again, that's an upper bound on latency and most submissions will be a lot faster. Uh, now I wanna talk about our LLM benchmark. This section is a little bit longer because I want to put it in context overall. So the first thing to understand about large language models is that they operate on tokens. Uh, a token is uh, typically a piece of a word uh, and uh, a language model simply takes a set of tokens as input and predicts the next token. Now you can chain this together to actually build a, a predicted sentence. Uh, but you know, my example here is just predicting a single token, which is if you say, why did the chicken cross the blank? You know, anyone here would be able to understand that the answer is road. In practice, LLMs are used in a wide variety of applications. You can use them in search, in generating content like essays or summaries. Uh, uh, the, the summarization is what we do here. Language translation. And one of the key things is that our LLM inference benchmark is actually quite different from the training benchmark. And I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a moment and sort of establish the relationship between those. Uh, one of the critical differences is it's the inference LLM is fundamentally performing a generative task. It's writing fairly lengthy sentences, multiple sentences. Um, and it's also actually a different and smaller model. Um, so uh, one of the reasons for this is that's actually representative of a wider set of use cases. Uh, in general, for training, the more challenging use case is training a really large model, but not everyone is going to want to do that for inference. Many folks simply don't have the compute or the data to really support uh, a, a really large model. Uh, so the actual task we're performing with our inference benchmark is text summarization. So we feed in an article, as this example indicates, and then tell uh, the language model to summarize the following article, right? Uh, and so then it'll emit a couple of sentences summarizing the article. Now, one process, one part of the process here is you have to take that article that's in text and convert it to tokens. Uh, that tokenization is not part of our benchmark. Um, there is a standard tokenizer that we use, but the time that it takes to tokenize isn't counted. Uh, so I want to step back for a moment and talk about large language model life cycle and how that maps into the ML perf world. So you have what people will typically call foundation models, which are, you know, truly massive models trained on really large and fairly generic data sets. And that's what you see in the left hand side here. And that's what we model in our pre in our GPT-3 benchmark with a 175 billion parameter model in MLPerf training. So this is actually called pre-training. And in general, what you're trying to do is go from a set of random initial weights using general data and a lot of compute time to understanding general relationships between tokens, right? Uh, that's not task specific. So, you know, you at the end of this, you get a language model that can predict the next word, but it's not going to be specialized for any particular task, uh, whether that task is search or chat bots or summarization. 
So then typically the next step is you will do what's called fine tuning. And as sort of as the picture indicates with fine tuning, you're using, you start from this pre-trained model and then you add in a relatively smaller amount of data to specialize the language model for a specific task. This is much less compute intensive. And then finally, at the end, you take that fine tuned model and you start doing inference with it. Um, Today, we're focusing on the right-hand side, the inference portion. But one of the things I want to mention is, you know, that we are working on a benchmark for fine-tuning. Uh, if you think about these three stages of deploying an LLM, there's probably an order of magnitude drop-off or more between the different stages, right? You know, the number of people doing foundation model pre-training is relatively small. Um, you know, we've heard about a lot of the companies that do this, OpenAI and Google and Anthropic, uh, Microsoft, folks like that. You know, your mom and, you know, a small company is not going to be doing uh, foundation model pre-training. So, you know, uh, typically. However, many, 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 many enterprises have, a, have enough data to do fine tuning, right? So you could think about... Uh, getting an email summarizer or a meeting summarizer that uh, is trained on all of the email within a company and fine-tuned using that proprietary data, right? Um, that would allow you to uh, very effectively summarize emails within that company, <clears throat> right? And so there's, a, you know, orders of magnitude more organizations that can do fine-tuning than this foundational model pre-training. And then lastly, you have folks who are actually deploying the models in inference, and there's many, many folks who can do that. You know, actually at, at ML Commons, uh, we are using a large language model to analyze our code and uh, our benchmarks and answer questions about it internally. So we're actually doing some amount of fine tuning in inference, but as a business imperative, uh, you know, we're not really training foundation models on our own data at all. So Sudipto uh, asked, what are MLPerf benchmarks in 2023? So I showed you the uh, ML. So each benchmark suite is different. Um, I showed you the outline of MLPerf inference uh, in a prior slide. So we've got about eight benchmarks. Uh, training and inference alternate by quarters. Um, there's also MLPerf mobile, MLPerf tiny, uh, and there are separate presentations on those that we'd be happy to forward to you. Uh, the fine-tuning benchmark will be part of the training benchmark suite. And so, uh, you know, again, the, the subject of today's discussion is our inference benchmark, which is using uh, the GPT-J 6 billion parameter model. So... <clears throat> Uh, Sean Kerner asked, when we've, so we've deployed an LLM from a startup. Ah, hold on. Uh, Sean, uh, is your question about our benchmark or about our in uh, own internal use of LLMs? The benchmark is, I'm talking, I will talk in the next couple slides. Oh, our own internal use. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. So, um, the LLM that we are using in production internally, it's actually really testing right now, looks at all of our GitHub repos. So that includes code as well as comments and as well as text. So it would look at, for example, the rules uh, of MLPerf training or inference. It would also look at messages and discussions about code changes and the, the deltas in the code. And a lot of that is, frankly, it's a way for us to dynamically generate documentation and help people get up to speed on uh, MLPerf benchmarks more quickly. <clears throat> so for LLM inference, uh, our benchmark is fine-tuned and, and, and the focus is on serving. So uh, we are using an open source model that is uh, uh, takes a hugging face checkpoint uh, uh, and the a uh, pre-trained model that we are fine-tuning was previously trained on 400 billion tokens from the pile data set. Then we are going to fine-tune it on the CNN Daily Mail data set. And I'll talk about that data set in more details. 
And, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, LLM inference model, there's a couple of architectural differences compared to the training model. One is it's a bit, it's much smaller, right? 6 billion parameters instead of 175. It's a 28 layer uh, transformer. Um, it uses a slightly different embedding uh, and has parallel attention and feed forward to decrease communication. Um, and as I mentioned before, the tokenization is not measured as part of the cost for latency and throughput. Now, the CNN Daily Mail data set that we use to fine tune is described here, right? So it's about 300,000 articles and then, uh, you know, multi, you know, a few sentence summarization of each article, right? On average, each of those articles is about 781 tokens and each summary is about 50 tokens. Um, so just some back of the envelope math to help you give, get a notion of context here. This was pre-trained on 400 billion tokens. Our entire fine-tuning data set is about 200 million tokens. And we didn't even have to use the entire fine-tuning data set to hit target, you know, our target accuracy, right? So again, that gives you a sense of scope. You know, a foundation model is probably, is several thousand times uh, less compute, sorry, more compute than fine-tuning. Um, and uh, our benchmark uses the validation data set from uh, CNN Daily Mail uh, to compute accuracy and performance. So this is the reference model um, that we use, GPTJ 6 billion. Uh, we've got 28 transformer layers uh, as described here. We're using the classic uh, GPT-2 and 3 tokenizer. Um, and then it was fine-tuned until it hit uh, the accuracy metrics. There's actually three accuracy metrics. Um, there's this Rouge 1, Rouge 2, and Rouge L. Uh, Rouge 1 is sort of the, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, it is the probability that a given word in the summary also appears in the underlying text. Rouge 2 is probability that any given pair of words in the summary also appear in the underlying text. And Rouge L is the probability that the longest, uh, that there is a uh, fairly lengthy, the longest substring of the summarization appears in the uh, uh, summarized text. Uh, so to give you a sense of scope and size, you, the reference model is in FP32 and it's just over 20 gigabytes. Uh, if you uh, cut that in half using uh, so reduced precision like BF16 or FP16, that would be nine gigabytes. And of course, some folks will probably be using eight bit representations that would be about four and a half gigabytes. Uh, and this is just a reminder of what the transformer layer looks like. Um, now, one of the things I want to point out that is really different, different between training and inference is sort of this autoregressive nature. And so we have an example here, which is that um, when you are doing the generation of text using uh, uh, an LLM, what you are doing is you need, there's this uh, sequential nature of it where you uh, have a prefix that you process that can all be done in parallel, but then you need to generate the first word. And only once you've generated the first word, can you generate the second word, the third word, et cetera. And so there's this se intrinsically sequential nature of uh, 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 generative text uh, and that's what we mean by autoregressive. So you're sort of looping through things again and again and again. And what that means is sort of the key value cache, which is used as part of this, uh, tends to get warmed up and see fairly substantial reuse. Uh, it also means that the latency is really high, right? If you want to just generate one predicted word, it's actually pretty quick. But when you're generating a whole summary, maybe a paragraph, 
um, that can actually be pretty lengthy, even if each individual prediction is fast. And that's why we have this 20 second latency target. Um, again, the quality targets that we have for uh, our uh, inference LLM are 99.9% .9 or 99%. And then the accuracy metrics, as I indicated, are Rouge 1, Rouge 2, and Rouge L. Uh, I'm showing the accuracy for the uh, reference model up here. Um, and in addition, we require that the generated text length must be greater than 90% of the reference. Uh, and part of that is to ensure that people don't just uh, generate really short summaries uh, as a way of optimizing performance. Um, uh, GPTJ is available in the data stream and edge benchmarks. So that means it'll be used in both single stream and offline for edge, and then server and offline for data center. As we mentioned, the uh, server latency constraint is 20 seconds. And then uh, the generation parameters uh, is a four wide beam search that does, uh, uh, it, so uh, Michelle, does this mean that we're generating at least 30 tokens at a time and uh, no more than 128? Is that uh, the way to parse those next two bullet points? Okay, perfect. Michelle is the uh, ML Perf Inference uh, co-chair. So um, as you go through and generate additional text in your summarization, you'll be generating between 30 and 128 tokens uh, in one fell swoop. All right, so that concludes our discussion of the new benchmarks in MLPerf Inference. And now I wanna to turn to MLPerf Storage. And I wanna talk a little bit uh, about sort of the motivation and then uh, also the history. Um, so we got MLPerf storage started uh, e e to a large extent at the urging of uh, Debo Dutta, who's from Nutanix and has been involved in a with MLPerf for a long time. Um, and uh, you know the point is that that is that storage is really a very significant aspect of training, but it's often underappreciated. Um, and you know Debo and I had talked about this for a while. And then, you know, I was talking to various vendors and customers, and one of the things that, that, that was mentioned to me is that actually um, there are some cases of pretty large hyperscalers who deployed really large training clusters that could not really hit their peak utilization because they didn't have enough storage. Um, and so I found that fascinating. And right, what that really means is that there's fundamentally a hard problem in storage and one that's underappreciated, right? Most hyperscale companies that are buying thousands or tens of thousands of accelerators have engineers on staff who are there to design proper storage subsystems. And so, you know, th th this just really pointed out that this is a critical area that is underappreciated. So we took the opportunity and uh, about two years ago formed uh, a storage working group focused on how you would measure performance for storage in ML. Uh, and I really want to thank everyone here uh, who's worked on this. This has been a fabulous working group. I kind of helped in incept the idea and mentored it. But a lot of this leadership was really from Juana, especially, who's a professor at McGill, Curtis Anderson, Janu, uh, and Huiho, who are our uh, working group chairs. But the entire working group really participated. And there's other folks who aren't mentioned here who may have uh, sort of left or switched employers along the way who've contributed. But this has just really been a, a fabulous experience to see storage go from idea to actual benchmark. So the, the reason why storage is critical is because, you know, data-centric AI really is about the data, right? And what that means is the capacity and the, the egress bandwidth become very important. I don't want to belabor the point on this slide in part because we're running late, uh, but storage is a critical portion of training. Uh, there's a paper at Meta that I linked here that says about a third of the power used in training is from data ingestion. So we wanted to understand the bottlenecks and the storage bottlenecks in ML workloads to help optimize that and help make buying decisions. And just again, to kind of set the context here, 
I'm going to go from right to left here. If you look at MLPerf training, we've got that cracked. That is the compute heavy benchmark measuring training. But as part of training, you have this online data loading, right? And so when you start, when you do training, you're loading in batches of data constantly from storage. Uh, MLPerf storage focuses in on that. Um, it really only focuses on the online data loading, not any pre-processing. Uh, it's very common to do pre-processing, but we, that's sort of outside of the scope of the first generation. Um, and then in addition, there's typically this offline uh, bulk data loading that might happen once a month or once a week where you're taking new data into your overall storage system. And there's oftentimes pre-processing there. That's also outside the scope of MLPerf storage, but is something that we want to develop a benchmark for in the future. So if you look at MLPerf storage, it's very tightly coupled to training and measures getting data um, out of the uh, 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 storage into the compute subsystem. So Ray asked is, are you pre-processing? Um, in the MLPerf inference, uh, storage benchmark, there's no pre-processing. In a lot of cases in production, there may be some pre-processing in your data loading. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what that might be like in a future slide. As you think about MLPerf storage, some of the key variables here are the ML framework, your storage stack, your network for storage, if it's non-local storage, uh, and then again, what the compute might look like. <clears throat> uh, the key accomplishments in MLPerf storage is we created a tool that represents ML training IO patterns that doesn't require having any compute or accelerators there. That's really important because if you want to size a storage subsystem for a thousand accelerators, you don't want to have to buy a thousand accelerators. It's quite extensible and scalable. And one of the things that's actually very interesting here is this is a very dynamic uh, tool that is coupled to compute. So the metric for MLPerf storage is uh, essentially how many samples per second can be streamed out given compute utilization, right? And so we model a compute subsystem and the key point is that if your storage falls behind too much, the compute subsystem will be idle. And we only allow 10% idle due to storage. So if your storage subsystem is too slow, you won't even actually be able to support any accelerators uh, and run the benchmark. Um, so here's sort of a brief primer and block diagram on this. So again, the the thing that we're focusing on here is this load data in batches between the uh, uh, the the data set, the disk here, the cache, and into the compute. Um, so now the the key point here is data is different for different benchmarks, right? Um, there's no pre-processing, and this is an extremely flexible benchmark. You can use it on object storage or block-based storage, um, and you can use it on local network attached or software defined storage. So it's actually quite, quite flexible, again, in, in the vein of MLPerf training. Some of the key variables to think about, uh, the framework and how it represents storage in the data loader is uh, can have a big input impact on the workload. Um, the storage stack itself can have a, a huge impact, like what Physical storage, is it NVMe, is it a disk? Are you using, uh, maybe you're using uh, serial ATA. And then how it's connected to the host nodes, right? Things that are over the network have some added latency uh, and complexity, uh, but you know, by putting it over the network, it might have more DRAM for caching. Uh, the type of data may matters, right? So images are much larger than text samples. And so when we'll see some details in a moment, um, and then uh, the other thing here is MLPerf storage is designed to incorporate caching, but not to allow the entire data set to be cached. And again, one of the key things here is simulating the compute. Uh, Debo just chimed in in the chat. Uh, being able to simulate the data set accurately in a way that is representative. We spent a lot of time uh, investigating that uh, and making sure that the simulation 
would would be accurate of the real world. Um, so we've got two workloads right now. We're going to add more. And again, uh, these are drawn from MLPerf training benchmarks. Uh, and the, one of the things I want to point out is just the difference in sample size, right? So for BERT, for, you know, your typical sample size is two and a half kilobytes. You know, the typical sample in image in 3D medical imaging is 146 megabytes. So, you know, actually getting a sample fed into the system is pretty different between these two things, right? One probably looks like a fetch of 150 megabytes of data with not a lot of control or disk seek time. Uh, whereas if you think about the number of IOs to, sus to sustain, say, a gigabyte per second, you're going to need many more IOs for something like uh, BERT. Uh, and we're going to be adding more uh, tasks, more data sets, uh, in the future. We just focused on two to start with. MLPerf storage has two divisions. Uh, one is closed. And in the closed division, uh, the framework data loader must be used unmodified, right? So standard PyTorch, standard TensorFlow. Uh, those are the frameworks we currently support. We, you know, if folks are interested in others, we'd be happy to allow that. In open, you can use custom data loaders uh, and make significantly more modifications to the storage stack. We got five submitters. I wanna congratulate all of them on submitting to a first time benchmark, uh, Argonne National Lab, uh, DDN, Micron, Nutanix, and VECA. Um, you know, it's, it's again, a really big deal to both help with the design of the benchmark and get across the finish line in the first submission. I'm thrilled to have all of these folks participating. Um, and we got a combination of storage represented here, parallel file systems, local storage, software defined storage, uh, and a wide variety of storage protocols uh, with 28 results for our first round. Um, and as you look at the results, you know, just sort of try and think through what they might say in looking at the differences and the similarities.